he's been involved in various forms of magical practices and ritual since the age of 11, including clairvoyance and clairaudience, regularly interacting with human and non-human spirits from the age of four years he quickly got used to balancing the normal and spiritual worlds. Working primarily with nature-based magic with a particular focus on herb magic and medicine, having apprenticed with a medical herbalist for seven years, his main focus is in the practice of and the use of folk magic, both historically and everyday use. Also a practitioner of various forms of ritual magic, including Abramerlin, Solomonic and Egyptian styles in the past, which have been brought into his practice in the area of house clearances and exorcisms. He ran a number of pagan groups over the years, along with celebrating seasonal festivals in an accessible form, open to people of all faiths, in the London area. Based in London and Dorset, where he regularly runs workshops and groups on a wide range of esoteric subjects, including magical herbs, shamanism, folk magic, witchcraft, astral projection, divination and dowsing. One of his popular open events are biannual fairy walks in local woods where he introduces people to nature spirits and ghosts. With a background in anthropology, he focuses on the shamanic aspect of British folk tradition and teaching academic and practical methods of cross-cultural shamanism and traditional folk, music, ma folk magic in historical and contemporary settings. Please welcome Trevor Wickens. Uh, thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you for uh, the introduction. Um, so basically tonight is a shortened version of a workshop that I should normally do on Shakespearean period use of um, herbs and folk magic and also reference to where they refer to in his plays. So some bits I will be going through quite quickly because I won't be giving the detail that I would normally give. And the other aspect is, because obviously this is part of the Dorian Valiente centenary celebrations, is that in Dorian's writings, um, books, etc., she often, there is numerous references to herbs. I mean, obviously the natural magic mentioned earlier, as probably the greater number of references. And the other aspect is, obviously we're doing this on Midsummer Night's Eve. So combining um, the Shakespearean and Dorian and the reference to a Midsummer Night's Eve. So I'll probably whiz through the talk as best I can. So we actually will have some time because I do have a tendency to talk too much and give too much information. Um, so we'll start with um, the slide, hopefully you can see the slides. So most people are aware of St John's Law being particularly a midsummer um, uh, herb. And here we have an image of the standard uh, fish and artists. So the St John's Wolf that has holes in the leaves. So there's numerous forms of St John's Wolf in this country and particularly with garden escapes and garden types and this the one you want is the one that has the little holes in them. This is a quote from Natural Magic. There's a sovereign magical plant of splendid golden yellow, the Ipericum or St John's Wort and if you pick it on Midsummer's Day it has magical properties for luck and love and will drive away evil spirits according to the old belief. And that's in Nature Magic. Now, for me, St. John's Wall is an embodiment of the sun. So in magic, or in spells, etc., I use it for protection, which is one of its particular associations. It's also good for 
protection, the protection, and also when you need to invigorate or energize. And one of the ways I use it is I make St. John's water oil, which is notoriously easy. All you do is get some of the flower heads and put it in some sunflower oil or similar and leave it on the windowsill for a couple of weeks, two to six weeks. So this is already infused with the energy of the sun and it's also very good to make use as anointing oil, but on a more practical level, medicinally, it's actually a really good as a, to help with nerve pain. Um, and so in the past, I've used it in combination with other oils for things like shingles and stuff like that. But for our purposes of tonight's talk, it's, it's, it's more magical uses. Um, the other things that I've used it for, traditionally it's used for, it's used in um, dealings with uh, court or legal proceedings. Uh, and as I say, generally it's considered to help with the legal proceedings. It's also seems to protect you from being, being uh, affected by legal proceedings. It's also a good one to include when you want material gain. It helps with that as well. And I normally include it in a mix with a number of other herbs. Um, I'm probably not going to explain every herb on that. And as I said, there will be questions at the end. So, and there'll be some information being sent out to people in the form of a PDF, which should be tailored to tonight's talk. So St John's will, if you can, tomorrow, um, go and pick some St John's wall flowers, make it into uh, an infusion in some tea, or just actually in water. And then if you actually apply the water to your face, or even drink the water on midsummer's day, this is considered traditionally a way of assisting you in seeing the midsummer spirit. Some people may used to make an eye wash and include that as washing the eyes, um, which would help you with the vision with the natural as well. Another one for collection today or tomorrow is the basically the small powdery seeds, the ferns. And we'll go with another quote from Dory. Another powerful charm worked on Midsummer's Eve was the making of the lucky hand. This talisman, talisman was made from the root of the mouth fern. The root was dug and the coal films cut away until only five were left. So that the trimmed root resembled a hand with five hooked fingers. The lucky hand was then smoked over the bonfire and preserved as a charm to bring good luck to its possessor and to fend him against ill wishes and evil spirits. So uh, ferns at this time of year again are something that's considered lucky uh, and protective. And another thing particularly associated with ferns is the idea that it is an in-between plant. I live in, the, in this world and in the world of spirits, more so than perhaps some. And this was probably taken from the idea that fern dust or the seeds collected from back of ferns could be used as a magical invisibility powder. And the idea is you would collect the powder into a small bottle um, and then this could be either sprinkled over yourself when you didn't want people to see you or carried in this little bottle around you. Um, and obviously it's not physically going to make you invisible, but it's going to make you less noticeable. And the idea is it makes you less noticeable to the people you don't want to see, see you. And this is like a doctrine of signatures. Anybody familiar with purposes will know about the doctrine of signatures. So the idea is that ferns are good places for animals, people to dive in and out of them, hide and disappear. Um, as anybody has seen, you know, old birds of deer suddenly disappear into the fern and you barely know that they were there or disappear completely. 
And this was used by um, not just animals, but people um, hiding, people poachers, um, smugglers, where the, the, the uh, fern cars were used to protect yourselves from the vision of other people. But this little bottle of fern dust, or fern seed, um, I've used as a amulet with a number of people, myself and some of my students. Um, and it seems to sort of work, probably enough, and that people don't seem to perceive you. A person on the other side of the road that you don't want to see you, or a person coming down the road walks by without noticing you, because you remember you've got your little bottle of fern dust in the pocket. And this makes you invisible to the ex-boyfriend or the ex, um, or maybe the uh, landlord, if you want to avoid them for whatever reason. All right. This is a, the next slide is a personal slide, which was shared to me by amazingly one of my teachers from my school days. And one of the reasons of the Shakespearean herbs talk is um, as I was asked to be part of a Shakespeare's play at school, which is the image here. This is me at my start 14, maybe, 15. And because of my, everybody knew of my interest in which, I was known as the witch of William Penn in my school day. Um, for when they decided Macbeth was part of the curriculum, they asked if I could do some things to make, you know, a bit more interesting or add some information on the witchcraft side of it. So some of it was doing a little bit on the herbs and some other aspects. So this is a little photo that at the time I didn't realise my form teacher had taken. He, he sent me this on Facebook group last year of me explaining some stuff about witchcraft to my fellow people who are going to be playing witches. The three of us will be playing witches in the play. So to be honest, I don't have much memory of the play, but we did do it. Um, so anyway, this is one of my early, my earliest occasion of teaching people about Shakespearean use of magical herbs. In a Midsummer Night's Dream, going back to our Midsummer thing, a herb is used by Puck to create a potion, the famous Tandy, which is involved in the potion, and he makes Titania take the potion, which is basically the Tandy, and this is what makes her fall in love with Bottom. Now, Tansies are traditionally used in love magic, among other things, and they do have an action on the art medicinally, but you don't medicinally you don't usually use them for that. But um, it's the common character to be added to spells with, um, for love spells uh, in the combinations that I teach for, um, using folk magic. So this is a, an interesting reference by Shakespeare, and we're as we go on, we'll be looking at why he makes these references to herbs and where also where some of the sources for these are. I mean, I love tansies because they do look like very small nature spirits. So they're quite similar in their look and they, the way they move in the um, with the slightest breeze encourages it to give that image. Apologies for interrupting. I just wanted to uh, mention that some of us are experiencing some audio issues. So when you right. speak, there is a, a, a little background noise. Okay. There is anything right. from your hand that could. Yeah, okay. Um, right. Well, maybe I'll get a bit closer to the mic. Um, let's see. The, a sort of back, background noise only when you actually start to speak. I don't know if it's related with the microphone, but I'll try a different. Of course, if, if any, if, uh... hello, can you still hear me? 
but I think I think uh, it didn't change much. But it's still, the, everyone is saying that it's still audible. So if there is any, if we cannot change any setup, we will. I think. Uh, okay. Uh, don't know if that's. Don't know. Is it, does it sound any better now? Or. It's yes. Out. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Very right. much. Sorry. Good, good for that. No, that's good. A necessary interaction. Um, right. This is another uh, thing that kind of relates to this time of year, um, and this is from Henry the Fourth. Well, through the Canamar. The more it is trodden on, the faster it grows, yet youth, and the more it is wasted, the sooner it wears. So chamomiles are um, an underrated plant in the sense that everybody just thinks of it as for calming tea. Um, but actually, it's, um, I won't go to, but for instance, it's mentioned in the nine, I won't go into the Anglo-Saxon, but it's mentioned in the Anglo-Saxon nine herbs charm. Uh, and that there it is given a more of an importance as a cleanser and protector. Uh, traditionally, it was used in wound dressings um, um, and also to encourage a harmony but in a different way to the way we think of drink chamomile tea. So it was often used as a thing to calm disputes. It's sometimes used as a thing to calm disputes in marriage or among couples. Um, it's some, I've, I use it as a, sometimes when I want to work with both the sun and the moon. So it seems to have the combination of the sun energy and the moon energy. Um, and in a sense, although it's on technically, if you look at the uh, tables of correspondences, it's given a masculine element and it's ruled by the sun. Quite often, I see it as being a, a, a feminine, or actually the combination of the masculine and feminine. I see it as a plant that combines the both elements, uh, which is why perhaps in folklore it was sometimes used in them uh, as a calming thing in relationships. And obviously, if you drink the tea, it will calm you down. Um, the other thing is. It's because it's very good at cleansing and clearing. As I say, we tend to think of cleanser when we talk about that these days in terms of herbs. But it was traditionally also used, chamomile water was another almost like poor man's only water in a sense that you could use chamomile water to cleanse and clear. And it would be used for breaking curses, removing evil, washing. You know, you wash, use it in washes or to cleanse the doors, etc. Um, and thresholds, more for thresholds. So that's another thing you can do with your chamomile tea bags is you can actually use it to make a sort of a cleansing holy water if you want to cleanse your home as well as you know, just use it as the tea. Um, so as a variety of uses, both medicinally, right, it's calming, it's cleansing, it's clearing. But also, it has those same actions on in the magical world, in the spiritual, in its spiritual aspects. And as I said, it can be used to calm a situation. So the way I work with things is I sometimes make herb bottles or, or pouches, or I sometimes make up like uh, almost like smudge stick type things with a, a combination of herbs which I'll burn into burn or burn it as a make an, an incense and use those combined elements so from what we've talked about so far so we've got um, the protection of St John's Wall we've got tansy which is love and that can be all sorts of love and then you could combine like chamomile in there so you have a calming calming situation in love so with the tansy maybe the love is too fierce and you want to calm it down a, a bit so you might want to combine chamomile with that energetically as it's like in the spell works system um, 
now I'm just very briefly, and the reason I'm doing this very briefly is just to give you a background to find a where Shakespeare came from, and I normally go into much more detail than this. But around the time of Shakespeare, we have things like Gerard Turbel. And Gerard was a very important English herbalist. Um, in a sense, he made an easily readable, translate, you know, understandable herbal that people could use. Um, and although it was a kind of a ripple of other work, but then most of the herbals at that time, up to the period of cold pepper, um, and this is just for my amusement. So this is like a facsimile of your nice pocket herbal produced by Gerard that you would have to kind of around your house or carry around with you your information on herbs as you would, because obviously this is the, obviously this is the nice pocket edition. But it's a, it's a useful book. It gives quite a bit of folklore in there. Obviously, some of the herbal information is a bit dubious, um, but as a you know, as a as a old herbal to have, it's worth having. But this is kind of the material that um, one of the sources of material that Shakespeare and basically cunning folk or witches would have used as a source of information. Those that had the money to be able to buy one. Uh, which was not many people. Um, but some, uh, some of the cunning men did have access to those sort of books and would you draw on them for their sources of information? Now, this is where it becomes more relevant to Shakespeare. Now, Shakespeare's daughter married John Hall. It was a very successful. Um, position and as physicians did at that time he um, obviously was mostly working with herbs and you know during this period we kind of developed the Latin uses of herbs but uh, the populace general populace didn't use Latin names they used folk names and if you're a physician, a distributing physician, so he had he was an apocryphy as well as a physician, um, he would need to know the folk names and what they were referring to. And because uh, I'll give an, ex, an easy example. So, for instance, Mugwool in Dorset historically used to be called Wormwood, which obviously is a different herb in modern times. So there's this whole translation between counties and areas where things would be used there, different colloquial names. And John, who has you know, dealt with this, would know of these names particularly because it would be part of his you know, ability to prescribe was knowing what his patients would know about. And because he was a member of Shakespeare's family, Obviously, this was conjecture, but it would be quite unlikely that um, that Shakespeare and John didn't talk about, you know, his practice. And I would imagine with Shakespeare's love of language and names that he'd be interested in John's interaction with the general populace, with the folk names. And it's these folk names that comes into Shakespeare's plays, and most famously the Matt Death play. To reference it, it's suspected there's another possibility that when in Romeo and Juliet, the, the idea of inducing the death like sleep of Juliet, that Belladonna was the suspect because Belladonna can give an appearance of death without actually resulting in death if you actually know the right level to do, but I'm not suggesting anybody experiment with this because that would be a very dangerous name to do. Obviously, Belladonna is um, traditionally found in many magical practices and is associated with its hallucinogenic qualities, its ability to kind of create the, an image of 
you know, along with other things like the Toro and stuff like that, to give the appearance of flying. Um, this is one of the ingredients in magic. Um, Rich's ointment, but that's a different discussion entirely. Um, then we have another of the poisons. Obviously, the poisons are popular in in literature because the you know people's interest is discovered with it. But here we have the Munsard, um, which just gets its name from very obvious appearance of its flowers, and it's also known as uh, Wolfsbane as well. Um, the idea it can protect you from wolves, werewolves, negative magic, uh, witchcraft, which is kind of, uh, but also is used as a poison. And again, going to Romeo and Juliet, we have this quote from Romeo and Juliet where Romeo says, Let me have a dram of poison, such soon speeding gear as will disperse itself through all the veins. That the life weary taken may fall dead, and that the trunk may be discharged of breath as violently and as tasty now as fire. And this is Romeo and Juliet. Um, now, for me, I haven't, don't normally use aconite, except in its homeopathic version, but in the past I've uh, used it uh, magically. I don't use it as much now because so it's difficult to get, and also it's quite. It's quite toxic, even the leaves. Um, it's in recent times, it has, been, it has been mistaken for other flowers and even sold in florists um, where it can be poisonous to the touch. And actually, once once went into a florist and told them that whatever the, wherever they'd pick these nice plant, it was uh, not appropriate for sale because it might kill your customer. Um, so, Think more people are aware these days, or perhaps things are better sourced. Yeah. Yeah. So, Calendula, um, I'm going to flip through these because it's obviously masculine sun, it's used for success, it's used for cleansing, helps protect. Helps overcome negative dreams, negative energy. And it's been calendula uh, in your magical practice as a cleansing and clearing of fact. It helps with prosperity. And it's just a generally a good plant to have. I mean, to be honest, I used to, um, when I used to grow it in my garden, my garden my cousin, I used to use it to, um, if I cut myself shaving and just put it on, and it would, it would stop the blood straight away. and um, that is a good thing instead of paper, which was very wonderful. Well. Here we have a picture of the bard himself. This is uh, a memorial to him in Southwark Cathedral. And as it happened when I was there, I happened to notice that somebody had put some rosemary in his hand. And obviously, rosemary is from remembrance. And we remember that because rosemary stimulates the circulation to the brain and other parts of the body, which is why it's good for dementia, uh, just memory loss, um, also good for the capillaries in the hand, so like Raynaud syndrome, arthritis, and etc. But what it's useful for in magic is it enhances whatever else it's with. So it strengthens a spell, it will increase its power, it will increase the speed of where it's delivered. And this is true with other herbs. If you combine it with other herbs, it would increase its delivery in the body. Um, there's some counters to this. You can't use it if you've got epilepsy and things like that, because it can, um, this sometimes disagrees with my people who suffer with migraines, although I suffer with migraines and I've never found it problematic with anything. I find it helpful. Um, and obviously, the main thing that you know is rosemary as remembrance is also it's traditionally associated with remembering the dead and being used at celebrations of, of the ancestor working with the ancestors vervain particularly witchy herb um, i've found it particularly useful in working with psychic stuff 
I used to use it a lot when I with some of my um, some of my groups as one of the teas I'd use with the psychic development stuff with some of my cousins in the past. Um, I used the different mixes of Vain and Mugwort and other things if I'm feeling really mean wormwood. Um, and it's a, just a general good herb to to have the calming situation, calming the mind, calming the body, and clearing on a physical and uh, esoteric process. Um, and again, it does work quite well on the, the nervous system as well. So some of these I'm going to rattle through because basically I've condensed a three-hour talk into an hour. Um, there's yarrow. Yarrow is one of those herbs that is very useful, important, but vastly underestimated. Usually it's underestimated because it grows in lawns and places like that. But when it's in those areas, because it's cut so much, it's normally like two or three inches high. Whereas a yarrow stalk is normally about three to four feet high. And traditionally in witchcraft, predating the brooms in historical literature, witches were believed to ride on yarrow stalks. Um, and it has traditionally been used in divination and also as a cleansing uh, thing. So it's, it's, again, it's in Anglo-Saxon uh, magical uh, pharmacopoeia. So it's used to, for cleansing wounds, protecting wounds. It's because it, it works on the capillaries. It also can help with memory circulation. It's also good for the lungs, which is why it's often in cold remedies. It's also good for the um, uterus um, and things like that. Sorry, I'm getting too much into the medical, which wasn't my intention. Um, this can be used in exorcisms. One way you used to use it as, uh, as your water dip, the flight, sprinkling your water around when cleansing a house or a place or particularly uh, an animal area. Um, and the other thing that's properly known, but not in, is, is also, as I mentioned there, it's used, the original I Ching sticks are made out of yarrow. So you can also do that to make your runes as a set of casting sticks, get full grown yarrow, either the big stuff, cut it up, dry it, and then you've got nice light sticks, which are quite good for casting and reading in whichever methodology you want to use. Um, be it, you know, I Ching or the runes or Ogham, etc. Right, the Scottish play, which is where I'm going to briefly go through because that's where most of the Shakespearean references to herbs appear. So there's a quote from Doreen. The special creatures of the moon goddess and the association of witches with theirs is a folk memory of the fact that witches have been associated with the moon goddess, as well as the horn god from time in the memorial. Shakespeare recognises this fact when he makes his three witches in Macbeth, worshippers of Egerte, the ancient Greek moon goddess of witchcraft. There is no mention of devil worship or invocations of Satan in Shakespeare's representation of witchcraft. Which is, you know, that's very simple. That's a good point. You know, at the time when he was writing, things negative stuff about witches were, you know, worse there. Uh, and it, they were people who were accused of witchcraft in a much more negative way than they had been previously. Historically, you know, in Britain, apart from the very short period, relatively short period, which is reasonably okay with the authority. Anyway, the quick herbs that are mentioned in the map there. So we've got the fenny snake, wooden eye of newt, toe of frog, wool of bat, tongue of frog, adders, etc. And this information will be in the PDF, so don't worry too much about that. Right, the first one fenny snake or woody nightshade. Woody nightshade, commonly known. Uh, snake flower, snake berry, good resources for these sort of names is Greekson's, the Englishman's flora, among others, but that's the one that's easiest to access because it's reprinted as a paper there. Um, and it's kind of generally, would you know, so it didn't really have much 
practical uses, but it was a common plant. Its flowers and berries were sort of prized for magical use more than the rest of it um, because of its sim the associations we were working with magically being good at being successful in magic also protective most of the five petal flowers are considered to be protective protective this one was also one that's particularly associated with being protective against negative witchcraft negative magic or overlooking but it was also properly used for overlooking i have newt um now, mustard seed seems a very humble plant, but with that humble plant, it has great power. So my way of looking at it is, you think it's a yellow flower. Um, obviously, you know, in the sun, bright sun, you take this in the sun. And then it concentrates, to me, it concentrates the energy of the sun into its tiny seeds, which have that heat, that sharp little bite. And that's kind of the seeds are releasing the heat of the sun into your body or magically into your spell. So from a relatively humble, small um, seed, we have the potential for releasing heat from the power of the sun in our magic. And a lot of the stuff in actually in the Macbeth is actually about producing the energy fire. Um, and whether that was what Shakespeare chose them or just because of the names is, is a, bit, a, a debate. We have the humble, but another very humble uh, plant, the buttercup, which again is underestimated and to your detriment um, because again it has a lot of energy, a lot of heat, um, and is also quite toxic. It can burn you. Because the juice of the buttercup can burn you, so you burn like you're burnt by the sun. If you're too close to the sun or get too much in, you can be burnt by the juice from the buttercup. Uh, and it has its cousin, the greater celadine, uh, which also has a much more traditional use for things like walks, etc. Um, so buttercups are not good things to eat, at least not the rest of the plant, because they actually are quite toxic. Can be quite toxic to people, although some animals like them. Um, and here we have this small quote. There were fantastic garlands did you come of grow flowers, which is not known for that, nettles, uh, daisies, and long purples. And this is, um, you know, the traditional days, you know, buttercup and daisy chain when you combine them. So that's probably not such a good idea. It give you that hot, hot, the heat and the sun and the and also the moon in my thing. Right, the wall of bat. And the wall of bat is um, holly leaves, or to be honest, hollywood. And uh, uh, when hollywood gets very damp, it gets a kind of spongy softness to this, which is where I think the folk name of wall of bat comes from. Obviously, when we think of holly, we think of the prickles, and that's protective. But also we've got the berries, and the berries are in the winter, um, providing energy storage, um, considered lucky, which is why they're considered protective and lucky, which is why we have the holly wreath. And then, of course, there's the other thing, is I put them in magic when I want adaptive protection because holly trees adapt to their environment. Um, so at the low level where the animals can eat them, etc., you get your prickly leaves. At a high level, you get smooth leaves. And that's because the holly tree is very intelligent and uses its resources where they need to be. And that's, for me, makes it useful when you're working in protective work where you don't want a general I'll keep everybody away, but you want a magic that is adaptable and is working with the needs. So you don't need to keep everybody away, but you need to keep some people away. You, you know, you don't need to keep your neighbours away, 
but obviously you need to protect your own from burglars. And you have this kind of obviously good one for those kind of concepts and that kind of magical work because it's an oversimplification, but this is kind of one of the ways I use it magically. Uh, Hound's Tongue, which was uh, also your other names and used it of animals, uh, is considered protective and reduces malicious talk. Um, and also protects you from being detected by animals, which is why it was sometimes used you know, as a burglar's thing. So the burglar that Hans Tom leaves in his shoes or in his pockets with the idea that because he had this there, the dogs wouldn't notice that he was coming or the animals wouldn't notice that he was coming. And this was also a traditional thing generally. It was, you know, just sheep rustling, etc., things like that. It was considered something that would hide you. A bit like going back to a fern leaf. It's like a almost like an invisibility but to detection by animals rather than people. Uh, um Addis Falk's tongue, it's a, it's, it looks a bit like Cuckoo Point, but it isn't. It's a re relatively rare fern now. I've only seen it in a few places now. I always see it as representing the divine feminine and use it as a substitute for the goddess if using one, two, three, Pacific, some god, goddess serves as a mix. Also seen as protective, also seen as being good for fertility. Um, I won't go any further than that. This is a favourite of mine. This is legs or ivy. Ivy is a herb I use a lot in my magic because it's very good for abundance, good for protection. It helps bind things in a physical sense and also a magical sense. Quite often we use it in bindings. This can be positive bindings, negative bindings. I binding somebody from saying saying negative against you or binding yourself from having. 10 pints and stopping you drinking 10 pints when you think you should only be having one. It's kind of, you can use it in different ways. Um, some some people I know, I've got me to use it on them to help them give up smoking, um, make a little effigy of them and bind them from smoking by using my bit, which is a mixed success. Um, Wormwood. Wormwood, I could literally talk all night about Wormwood, um, but I'm not going to. Just do this quick reference. My sugared tongue to bitter wormwood taste. Wormwood is a very important magical herb. It's one to help improve psychic powers. Uh, it's extreme bitter, um, second only to gentian in the terms of European bitters. Um, I used it sometimes as part of certain rituals, like I quite often use it as a potion to represent death at Halloween. Um, usually my coven people say it tastes like death. Um, it's as, you know, the ability to promote hallucinogenic dreams, etc. but generally not, people are not going to drink enough of it and it's herbal state because it tastes so foul. However, its distilled form in as the as absent has been used traditionally by various people to see hallucinogenic uh, dreams or images and hence the 1920s and 30s um, French uh, art. Um, Fantastic herb, good for your digestion, good to help cleanse you. Obviously, it's an antiparasitic, um, thermifuge, and was traditionally strewn in pub floors along with the various other things to keep insects and parasites at bay. As I say, it's really, if you're not familiar with wormwood, it's one that's worth investigating. It's got so many magical uses, and um, it's also one of the best things you can burn in an, uh, to exercise 
really negative spirit to match better than like, pretty much anything else to be honest. It's very effective at getting rid of negative energy. Um, Holtzfer, another one of my favorites, of such a versatile thing. Um, um, also known as asphalt, also any of those kind of things. It's the plant associated with sun. It's one of the first flowering plants. And unusually, it flowers before it produces leaves. It's also known as poor man's asparagus uh, because the flat things come out, they look like asparagus tips, and then they die back and produce the leaves. The leaves, sorry, the flowers collected and put in honey makes a fantastic cough um, remedy. Um, especially if you mix a bit of thyme in with it. Um, also, the leaves are very good uh, in smoke mixes to help with people smoking, to help to detox the lungs, uh, to clear the lungs. Um, and also, traditionally mixed in, combined with uh, mugwort as a smoking mix to produce visions. Bear's foot or ladies' mantle. This is a fun one. Uh, the leaves are big, uh, gives the you know, ends the bear's foot. It's very much a feminine one. It's used uh, medicinally for like anxiety, helping with menstrual issues. Um, but traditionally, it was used in love uh, magic. And one of the ways it worked, uh, and there's been a revival of the use of flowers in the last 20 years in the floristry. Um, posh floristry, as the, the flowers were often used to encourage a lover or to bring a lover into life. And there's stories of, uh, of uh, ladies' maids putting sprigs in the beds or under the pillows of their ladies that were rather late in reaching the marriage and, and courting stage. So it promotes fertility, it promotes marriage, it promotes love, it's for women to use uh, for physical and also uh, anxiety. Yeah. Go Snapdragon. Snapdragon is a, such a fun flower. Um, I, when I do my workshops, I usually have some examples of these and pe don't tell them people what they are until I show them. Um, as yes, dried snapdown of dragon flowers look like this called skulls. And what we tend to forget is with planting, there's lots of reasons why traditional English gardens had the way they were planted. And snap, the, the snapdragons were often planted on the borders of gardens and on the edges to help keep spirit negative spirits out of the gardens, much as you do with the you know with the pumpkins or more originally turnip heads. The little skulls were there to scare off the other spirits. So the slave would think, oh, there's spirits there already. We won't go in there. And this is what they were used for. That's why they used to be grown on the edge of garden. So it's a protection method. Uh, and also used in... Right, another one of my favorite plants is mullein, here known as graveyard dust. Mullein is a fantastic plant if you've never seen one in the wild or up close it's really amazing it's a good five to six easily five foot has incredibly soft leaves almost unbelievable soft leaves um and herbally it's used for calming soothing soothing digestion soothing the lungs is another one of the lung mixes um energetically it's very strong um if you see it, you, you will almost feel the plant before you see it, and the plant is quite big. As I said, it's very big. You know, you're looking at a good five, six feet with a good sort of three foot wide at the base. The leaves, as they mature, are almost snow white downy leaves, and there's lots of magical spells that you can do with the leaves and with the seeds and as well. Oh, I won't go too much because I'm going to run out of time. Um, knotweed. Knotweed is magically very useful if you want things to grow very quickly in terms of magic. If you put it a little bit of knotweed, and not Japanese knotweed, I wouldn't recommend having that in that. Um, 
not with in your spell, like the rosemary, it will invigorate, it will make things happen more, it will speed up the energy, increase the energy. And also it's a good one for binding, particularly binding in negative magic. People do it if you see that. Uh, hemlock, obviously not one I recommend you using. Um, but traditionally is involved in astral projection. It's traditionally in some of the flying ointments. Um, magically, I've used it a few times, but it's a bit strong. Uh, my herbal, one of my herbal teachers always used to say, there's no such thing as a poison as a plant. It's, the plant is too strong for most people. And hemlock is one of those things that is too strong for most people. I'd say all people, unless you really, really know what you're doing. Um, right, back to the three riches. I think I'm going to skim through this. But there's the ingredients of the cauldron. A lot of these are mentioned previously in the herbs above, but we haven't got time to go through. We need to go through that. Um, and this is going just briefly going back to um, the reference by Joy Valiente early is that, you know, this is the summoning of Egerty, which is in Chase in, in Macbeth. And I just think it's interesting that this was kind of included. And it's actually quite, to be honest, quite a good summoning. I don't work with Egerty particularly, but this is my be useful one. Um, Egate, goddess of the moon and stars, be with us this hour to cast our spells at the crossroads. We do meet since time was none. May wind arise and fire burn. May earth devour and water stir. Egate, 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 be with us this hour. It's kind of a nice little charm, and I think that's probably could be used more. Um, right. So, skipping through this so we have time for questions. And this is a, a quote from Shakespeare, Banquo. Where such things here as we do speak about, or have we eaten on the insane route that takes the reason prisoner? At death, that one. Uh, the folklore around Mandrake is ex extremely, uh, and it's amounts of it. I'll just read you this quick quote from Dorian Valiente. Perhaps the most famous talisman of fertility, wealth, and love is the mandrake. It is mentioned in the Bible. The childish Rachel, Jacob's wife, Bethany's other wife, her sister Leah, for the mandrakes that Leah's son, Reuben, had found growing in the fields. Leah made a bargain with Rachel that she would have the mandrakes on condition that she made Jacob spend that night with Leah instead of her. Rachel evidently believed so ardently in the magical virtue of Mandrake that she agreed and the bargain was worth it, as if afterwards Rachel gave birth to a son, Joseph, Dorian Valiente. Um, the association with using it as an effigy um, is good if you can afford it. Mandrake has always been really expensive and it's still quite expensive. Yeah, good group. Just a curious aside if you didn't know. Because it was so expensive and the thing was a bit looking like um, people, they actually sometimes were grown in moulds. People would put, grow them in a mould so it would give it a more human shape, which would give it a much higher price. And bearing in mind, we're talking in the 16th, 17th century, roots would go for hundreds of pounds even back then. They were considered that important magically and energetically. And they are useful for lots of things, but the side effects of them physically are that nobody uses them anymore. So they, they can be used for mental health and illness and all kinds of things. But the violent, the violent side of it is that it may help you, but you may also shit and pee yourself and vomit for a week. So it's a... Uh, and be completely incapable of doing anything for yourself. So you'd have to have really understanding family or friends around while you were trying to cure your mental health with a mandrake root. Uh, and obviously, you know, it can kill you because it can, because of such violent purgative nature, so it can kind of make you dehydrated to the point of death. 
Um, right. That is massively shortened. I haven't said half the things I would normally say about the plant, but um, this is just to condense it for you. Um, if you want information, you can find me and contact me on my Herb and Folk Magic Facebook page. And if you want some herbs that are difficult to find, then you can look, contact Edgegrove Herbs, which is another page that where I have the su supplies of a um, mixture of wild grown in garden, wild crafted, organic herbs. Um, some of them are not always easy to get hold of, and we've got stocks of some of those. And you can contact us there. Um, if you look at the Urban Folk Magic page, I do do talks periodically and just trying to get back into doing more workshops. Pre COVID, I was doing workshops in London, Dorset, I guess, Treadwalls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, open to build up my workshops again in the coming months. Um, any information about that will be there. Or you can just ask me questions that you don't want to ask in public. You can ask me via that thing. Um, now, open to questions. Well, thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to invite to our Sorry. Who? Can't hear anybody of mine. Oh, I think I think Marco's frozen. <laughs> uh, Marco, can you hear us? He's frozen. I'll send him a message. <laughs> um, oh, okay. You're back again. Oh, uh, oh your connection's not no. too good, Mark. No. no. Is he gone? Yes. Vanished or something. He's vanished. Okay. Yes, he's gone. Oh. Well, thank you, Trevor, uh, <laughs> for this. Marco was going to end, and I think he had a question that he was going to ask you. Uh, Marco, are you here again now? Yeah? No, you, your um, it's your connection, Marco. Uh, so hello. Can you hear me? Ah, oh, that's better. Yes. Right. Yes. Brilliant. Water. Everything, uh, computer. Anyway, I've got questions. This books. Can you all hear me now? You keep breaking up, Marco. You're, you're, you're sounding like a, a, a bad extra in a, in a Doctor Who film. Could well, I the... perhaps ask a question? Yes. Um, you talked about using rosemary earlier, and I wondered in what format you use that. Uh, well, the rosemary, depending why you're using it, but you can use it for all forms. Uh, so use it as a tea, obviously. Um, if it's an offering, just a dried herb. Um, again, rosemary is another one that lends itself to being used as a water sprinkler. If you want just a simple mm. sprinkler water. Um, I well, was particularly interested because you talked about it helped with memory and things, and I, I was wondering if it was something that you were to use drink as a tea on a regular basis. Yes, you can, that you would... can do. The only contraindication would be epilepsy, uh, right. really the main one for that. Mm -hmm. uh, you definitely can't have it at all if you've got any form of epilepsy. Uh, the other way is, of course, you can use the essential oil, which is mm. why... Um, Quite often, loads of students go around buying rosemary essential oil up to exam times. 
Um, but the best way, really, for me is if you're wanting to do it with circulation, is as a tea. Um, Thank you very much. Unpleasant. I guess my audio is not uh, didn't improve, so we can move to the next question. Yeah. Uh, was um, there was a question about Tansy? Yeah. So Adele was asking why is Pansy labeled Tansy? It was. Why? In a slide numbers. What the viola? No, it was uh, why? Why is tansy marked as pansy? Oh, uh, uh, slide uh, number six. Maybe, maybe it was accidentally. Ah, you know. oh, there. Uh, oh, wow. Well, yeah, because wild pansy is yeah. also it's also is this is where you get the different names in different areas. So we're looking at um, I was looking using an old book, oh. and the modern basically the modern pansy is like a cultivated variation on the on the on the trick on the pansy. Um, so it's a it's basically ancestrally you go back. It's it's because that's what they used to call. Uh, what pansy is the cultivar, the cultivated, but some people sometimes used to call tansy a wild pansy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Look at Does that like answer that person's question? Grease, etc. I think it says it in things like Grease or in um, Gerard, etc. Yes. Um, another question. Uh, in your experience working with herbs magically and medicinally, have you found any crossover with the energetics of the herbs? Crossover in terms of what they medicinally do and what they uh, magically do. Yes, I think Ross answered asked that question. Yeah, so basically most of them, if you really think about it, yeah. Oh, I've got that crossover going on. Um, so we think of St. John's Wall. So St. John's Wall, um, you know, in popular parlance, St. John's Wall is thought, you know, for its ability to deal with stress, depression, anxiety, etc. And if you think about the idea that it, used, it was used as a protection and as a thing to remove demons, oh. in a sense, it's used as a thing to get rid of things, exercise, the exercise in mind. And in a way, that's kind of a crossover. You're dealing with, you know, spiritual demons, which could also can be mental demons, if, if you see it. I mean, that's one example. Or again, the tansy does work on the heart medicinally, but it's not used for various reasons. Um, but also it's used, you know, romantically, spiritually on the heart. See what I mean. Yeah. Yes. Is that okay, Ross? I don't know where she that's, is. That's, that's lovely. Thank you. Okay. Um, with with that, you said was it, you just said how tansy works on the heart. Would you say that's energetically in the same way as rose works on the heart? Well, rose doesn't really have a medicinal action on the heart. So it's rose tea is calming. So in a sense. It's calming and work on the heart. If you had anxiety and your anxiety was causing issues with your heart, and it works so, on the energetic heart, though, doesn't it's working it? Working on the energetic heart and it's working on the physical heart, but not in quite a direct way. So you would do with something like hawthorn. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely, wonderful. Thank you very much. And as a point, I use um, when I do effigies for. Effigies, puppets, or more mats, or whatever how you describe them for the face. If I'm using um, a healing one, I will use a small rosebud as the heart for the effigy. Um, when I'm doing calming and healing work on um, somebody using them. Um, so that fits back to the doctoring of signatures. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. Lovely, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, now, there aren't any other questions. Oh, there's just one from Alison. Uh, if you could have only one herbal book, which one would it be? Oh, that's quite difficult, actually. I mean, um, I'm going to sort of actually might plug somebody. Well, this. I've had the Englishman's Flora for a very long time, and if you want an old book that's good for sources of folklore and all the names, that's very good. But I'm actually going to plug somebody mm. who's written a good book on a magical, one of the better books on the magical, I've got so many books on the magical uses. Of the but um, Tyler, I can never pronounce the name, Tyler and Henry who wrote The Magical Properties of Plants and how to find them. Yes. Chulun, is it? Chushan. Chulun Henry. Yeah. Uh, and this, she did this, She read, did her book last year, year before. Yeah. Um, as I say, I've pretty much read every, well, I've read actually every book on the magical uses of herbs and I've read pretty much every herbal that is going. Um, and this is actually one of the better ones. It's got it's very informative, got lots of useful information, and also talks about working with the energetics of it. Um, so to me, that's one of the better uh, books on the subject. I'm sort of in the process of writing a bit myself, but um, the one I'm doing it was heavily illustrated. And the problem with that is it's, um, I've been working on it the last couple of years, is doing all the... Um, photographs for it so it's a slow process of photographing all the herbs in different stages and stuff that I'm working on that must one of myself. Yeah okay that's marvellous. Um, Marco I think you have something to say? Is he gone again? Yes. Oh wow. Yeah. Can you hear me? That's very loud now. <laughs> loud and clear. Go on. <laughs> that's brilliant. I will try to not shout. It's <laughs> about a book which yeah. the book it all hang now. No, it's hanging at home. Um, I got a comment. So one question is: um, Do we now as contemporary pagans and witches, do we now use only ancient symbology on our herbs and, and you know, symbology mutuated by uh, folklore, or is there anyone working or writing about uh, new interpretations for plants? Or is there a way where we can give a specific interpretation to a specific plant? Well, the way I tend to teach, obviously, this is a very you know, normally when I teach a workshop on the herbs, or actually the magic on medicinal herbs generally, it's a two day workshop. And we cover 40 herbs and then we work with them, do etc. But one of the main ways I say is when you're magically working with herbs, uh, you can use the correspondence books and stuff, but to be honest, quite often I find myself disagreeing with the correspondence type book is what you do is you have the intention of what you'll want to do magically and then with that intention go out to an open space if you park countryside whichever and see what plants call to you and uh, pick only what you need i really you know, people don't need to, if they're used working magically, you do not need to take an entire tree to use it, use it magically. A leaf or a flower will do. And like with the herbs, it's the same. You don't need an entire plant. You can just work with the leaves or the flowers, etc., and just pick enough for your use. Uh, because the other, the other point is, is if you, if you take all the plant, Yes, medicinally you can use an old plant and etc. But if you're working energetically, 
you want to work with the energy or the plant spirit and the plant spirits are that place so if you wipe out the place all the, all the resources of where the plant spirits manifest in those plants then that it will actually weaken your your magic whereas if you take an offering from them a part of them a leaf or whatever then that can is connected magically still with the energies of that place with the spirits of that place and in your spells in your magic that means that when you perform your magical practice you've got that connection with the energies of the of the plants and that place and that will strengthen the magic and how you work it now apart from that side is when you go out sensing or trying to find a plant or herb is we've all probably experienced it is when you go out sometimes it'd be a completely still day there's no wind there's no nothing and then you look and there's one leaf on one plant manically waving at you then that's probably the plant that's going to help you that day yeah and that might be the plant that you need to have and work with magically for that spell or it might be some tiny insignificant plant and you're walking along thinking you know, it's like some really something tiny like eyebrow or scarlet pimpernel or something that's really small and you then you you're thinking oh what plant can i use to do this spell what will help me with you know and you know what will help me with the vision to see my future and you walk past and ignore uh, some eyebright because it's a tiny little plant well actually maybe that's the plant you need to help you see your future so it's it's looking for the signals to you and what i also suggest i do these various exercises with the people i teach and it's about feeling the energy. So it's feeling the energy when you need it and what talks to you. And also what's quite good is ideally, if you don't know what the plant is, take that plant or that thing and then take it back with you. And once you've decided, oh, magically, this means this plant is going to be useful for this spell because it's, I was drawn to it for this. Once you've decided you're going to use that plant for the spell because it showed itself to you, you'll be surprised how many times, if you look it up, there will actually be the plant that's in the book that says, oh, actually, and you can use this plant for it. Because it's our ancestors, that's how our ancestors identify plants. That's how our ancestors put tables. That's how they knew what plants to use. It was connecting with the plants of that energetic level. It was connecting and seeing it and feeling, you know, understanding the doctrine of signatures or understanding that this plant is waving to me when I need it. And that process is historically what happened and we can still draw on that process. We can still draw on finding the energy of the plant, the energy of the place. And that plant will say, you can use me for this. Thank you. Invest it check it what it is before you take it thank you very much Levo. thank you very much for your answer um i think we need to conclude the evening um i would like to thank i, I um uh, close my camera just because i think <laughs> the connection will work better um i would like to thank uh thank you trevor again for giving this talk and helping uh, us in our a series of talks to raise um, funding for the Doreen Valiente Foundation. And I would like to thank all of the participants for keeping on supporting us. I would like to tell you and to remind you, what are you supporting exactly? So you are supporting the work we are doing on the collection of magical artifacts once belonged to uh, Doreen Valiente. We are working on it at the moment. Um, we uh, are uh, studying the collection. We are um, cataloging it and uh, we are conserving it. So uh, you are really supporting uh, our mission. And I've got a little anticipation to give you uh, and I won't tell anything else, but in the winter, we're gonna start our 
um, little lectures directly on the collection. So we will speak of categories of objects contained into the collection. So you will finally be able to um, see the collection and, and see what is it all about. And this is our first um, attempt after years, after the, the display that you might have seen in Brighton, to make the collection available and accessible to the public, even if only digitally for the moment, but this is a step necessary to go further and find a forever home for our collection. So thank you very much for what you're doing. And we, uh, we will get back to you with some very interesting outcome very, very soon. Keep your eyes peeled, as uh, I guess you say in English, <laughs> and, and wait for us. Okay. That's marvellous. Thank you, Marco. Um, thank you so much, Trefor. It was brilliant, really fascinating. And um, I believe you're going to send out some notes afterwards, are you, to the attendees? <laughs> We've got everyone's email address, so we'll be able to send them out. Okay. Yeah. Yes. We'll hopefully be able to do it over the weekend. Oh, yes. There's no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> But well, thank you so much. Okay. You can go and have a rest now. Have a chamomile tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much for Bye. organizing it. Thank you very much, Trevor, for speaking tonight. Bye. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. <laughs> oh, Trevor, that was wonderful. Yeah. Yes, well uh, done. You did really well. It was fabulous. Yes, yeah, so, and I probably um, could have been done with reducing stuff and then spending more time on certain things, which might have been more useful. To do. Okay, well, it's but, trial uh, and error. It was uh, good for me. I loved it. It was. It was absolutely amazing and very interesting. Yes. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, well, if ever you want something on a different subject or you want to work on something like very specific, yeah. Uh, then I could do like on more detail on just a few. Yeah. Either. I mean, I, lo I love the way you reference storing all the yeah. time that made it so relevant. Yeah. Um, that was absolutely perfect. And there is um, a quote from Doreen somewhere, I don't know where it is, uh, but when she was talking about when the war ended, the Second World War, yeah. um, she was talking about loose strife, which oh, started to grow everywhere. Yeah. Did, did you remember her talking about that? Yeah, no, I do. Uh, uh, somewhere. And uh, I looked up loose strife and it comes from... Uh, I haven't got it now, but it comes from a Greek word, two Greek words, yeah. meaning ending the war or yeah. war ending, which is fascinating. It's fabulous. Yes, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a What's boring. this word? Sorry, what is this word? Well, it's, it's an English kind of weed or a herb called loose strife. I'll put it in the chat. Oh, you are you in the chat now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Loose strife because yeah. strife means strife means uh, arguing and struggle. Uh -huh. And so to loose it means that you you break the struggle and ah. don't struggle anymore. And that's the name of the herb as well, or the weed. It is sort of a tall spin herb with sort of purpley red flowers which grows on um, basically disturbed land so it, it's Aww. quite it's quite good for um you know it will grow on old building sites and old yeah. railway tracks and anywhere like that but it, it like a bomb site it would grow yeah, on a bomb site. Bomb site. it's one of the yeah. plants that's kind of the first you know 
it's one of those ones that kind of takes root in the early days. Oddly, like St John's Wall is another one that does that, uh, but you don't see it so much. To um, have a calming effect on the yeah, so it, disturbed yeah. land. Yeah, it calms. Mm. It calms and sort of like re-establishes nature in a sense. Um, I like that. That's great. And it sort of it does seem a resurrection. It's kind of the resurrection you know, of, of life. Which is, you know, with the fire, the sort of ready, fiery, and the way it grows, it's very tall, quite an abundant yeah. tall. Yeah. It gives a kind of a nice energy to it. That's it. Brilliant. Thank you. Lizzy Mark, or Lizzy Maria, means exactly what you said. Marco, you're it, breaking uh, up again. <laughs> no, I was, I was just saying that I've seen Nick and Lizzy Mark, Lizzy Mark, yeah. 